tell you how many little Holy Spirit things have happened today in confirmation about what I felt like the Lord was telling me to bring tonight. It's so strange. And I'm not a guy that is too quick to call something like a, you know, a God week or something. But I set out, I was going to holler at uh, Dave John and tell him. <laughs> it's also funny that people that are meeting him for the first time, they automatically make his name one word because <laughs> they hear us. It's just so funny what, what I've created. 
Dave. That's how I know you're my friend if you call me Dave, John. <laughs> <laughs> if you call me Dave, we're not friends. <laughs> but I, I needed to find uh, two different, you know, whether it would be a kick ball or, or whatever, two different balls with stands. Um, and I never thought I would be able to get the colors that I, I didn't know what existed out here. And I thought, oh man, I gotta call Dave on. He'll help me find two different balls and then a flashlight and then a way to set it up, which I'll figure that out still. And I had that on my mind and I forgot to ask him. And so then after the, the pottery thing, I came around the building and Austin and Chris had uh, broken into the <laughs> storage shack back here just to see what they could see. And I said, what's in there? And Chris said, oh, just game stuff. And I said, oh, well, let me look. And I looked, and everything is sitting there. This is pretty specific. Yeah. And it's all sitting there. And I thought, even, even Chris and Austin, with their crime, <laughs> are flowing in the vein of God. So then I've heard stuff with the devotionals today. I've heard things come up in conversation. Uh, something happened last night, something happened this morning, which I'll, I'll touch on. And, and then in the song service, even the songs that we talked about earlier that I liked, I forgot the lyrics that were in them. And when you did the lyrics, I thought, this is too much. It's too much for, for coincidence. And so I've heard the Lord, and uh, I'm so excited about this. I wanna start with, a passage from Genesis, which is not going to seem to make a lot of sense uh, in light of what I'm saying for a few minutes, but then it will. Genesis chapter 1, verse 14. And uh, I'm going to intentionally take a verse out of context. <gasps> we are going to pull from this verse. Not the lesson in its setting, but we're going to grab something about the heart of God that's revealed within the verse. So, and God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made the two great lights. The greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for this moment. Thank you for Man Camp. And thank you for all of those that are here. We honor your presence. We recognize your manifest presence. And we honor you. And we thank you. Help us not to take it in vain. Father, speak to us tonight. Speak to our minds and to our hearts. And I know that we're going to leave changed. Help me to say what you are saying. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Last night, uh, I think it was Nick and Jeremy and I, I think maybe Adam was sitting there. And we were looking at the fire. And nobody had said anything for quite some time. Look at the fire. And I had a thought. I said, I said, isn't it crazy? A campfire? I said, isn't it crazy how human beings, you know, we will build this campfire and we will sit around and stare at it. For a long time and just look at it. You know, I mean, ASMR, you know. How many of you ever built a fire by yourself? And you'll sit and look at that fire, you know, and just look at it. 
And you can never, I think part of the stimulation with it, you can never conquer it in your mind exactly what that what the, what it is and you're watching it move and you're watching different colors come out and then depending on what the fire touches you know if there's a little copper in it or whatever you see some green you see some purple you see some blue you see this and that and last night there was one flank and it was also almost black in the middle and we're sitting and just watching for a long time I, and i said that i said isn't it crazy how long we will just sit and look at it at a fire we can't wrap our mind around it just sit and look at it so we're sitting there and i'm you know i'm quite satisfied with it i don't need the fire to do anything else it's just it's fire you know it's great it's very calming etc cetera, etc cetera. how many were at the sunrise fellowship this morning I'm not trying to obligate anybody to get up earlier than you want to. If you're able to sleep, sleep and get your rest. If you happen to be awake, it is worth, we're doing it inside this year. And Dave John's already got the fire going. Did you go to the pavilion and look first, T. Roy? No, I, I, well, I looked there and then I yeah. looked outside at like six and seven okay. and eight. And I'm like, well, I don't see them. I don't, place. Sorry, we're, we're doing it up here. And so anyway, it was good this morning. It was really, really a special time of fellowship. We sang and then we laughed and we told stories and we sang and we laughed. And then Levi brought uh, just a great, great, solid word. It was good. It was very good. But I've got to tell you that something happened that I, I don't think I'll ever forget. You ever notice how when you try to plan great things, they may or may not turn out like you want. But then things that you don't plan, some little something will happen in your day. You know, at some point in your life, you've got something that happened as a kid, or and it was impactful, and it just, it stayed. You know, or somebody said a certain word. They never even remember years later that they said it, but for you it became a part of you. So this morning, we're getting ready to start, and we put our chairs over there because... Uh, Dave John had a fire going that he slept next to it last night. And we shared our prayer requests. And Dave said, he said, okay, he said, let's all just be quiet for a minute. He said, let's just look at this fire. He said, let's be quiet. He said, and then I'll pray. You begin to hear that fire wrap around the logs. spark. You could hear the like breath coming off of it. I don't know how to explain what happened in that moment. And everybody just stood there. And then he began to pray. That's probably going to be my favorite moment of this camp. And I think I will never, ever forget what happened in that moment. Something happened in that moment. So in all of these moments, moments leading up to man camp and these different times we've had since we've been here, whether sitting around the fire there, here are different conversations. I am almost constantly praying in my heart. Even while I'm talking, there's like this just stirring in my heart. And I'm seeking, I'm seeking, and I'm seeking. Because I don't ever want to just say something. I want to say what God is saying. And I'm praying about preaching. I'm praying about what to preach. 
and how to preach it. There are different, Micah, I think you're going to receive a whole lot from this because I've seen some of what's in your heart. There are different types of preaching that are for different purposes, and we need them all. But there is one thing that seems to be almost entirely missing in 90% of the preaching that we hear. And it is the preaching where we just sit and look at God himself for no other reason but to sit and look at God. Preaching that is about God. Preaching that points to God. Preaching that causes us to behold God without any ulterior motive. Not looking at God for what we need him to do. Not looking at God for what we want to get. Not for any of these things. But preaching that tells who God is just because somebody ought to talk about who God is. To observe who he is because he is God. To rest simply in awe of him. Something that is amazing and sad if we will pay attention is the number of preachers and the number of messages being preached that in the message we never learn anything about God himself. You can flip through radio stations and you can flip through television channels and you can listen to a lot of preachers and never learn anything about God. We hear a lot of messages and a lot of sermons about us. We hear a lot of messages about life topics. We hear a lot of messages of how to live through every single thing that we may ever face. But we don't learn about God himself. Who he is, how he is, and what he is like. A great majority of messages that we hear, you could actually remove God and his word from the message and not really harm the talk. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. The great majority of sermons, and I use the term loosely, the great majority of messages that we hear, what they are saying and conveying would work whether they had God in it or not. Bible verses are basically used as decoration for what the speaker already decided they were going to say. God wasn't sought for what he wanted to say, but rather God was added to the human message as an endorsement to validate the speaker. I know that in my life and for the river, God is, <laughs> God 
is calling us to sit and stare at the fire. God is calling us to behold its layers and its colors and its power and effects to become warm as it is warm, to be different as it is different, as he is different. Is anybody hearing what I'm saying? To be still and know that he is God. So let's just look at him. For the next few minutes, let's look at God. Without trying to get anything or without trying to learn it for uh, success in some area of life, let's look at God without the thought of how to get peace to make it through the night. Let's look at God without trying to figure out, hey, how am I going to get joy because I'm sad? Let's look at God without figuring out how we're going to break our depression. Let's look at God without figuring out how we're going to get healed. Let's look at God without figuring out how to fix our family or our marriage. These are wonderful things. These are wonderful things. But let's look at God for no other reason than to look at him. Just look at him. So let's do it. Our calling... These, I'm stepping on these no matter what, I can feel them under my heel. It's driving me nuts. I guess I should have used a cordless. Oh, that's a good idea. <laughs> thank, thank you, wise one. <laughs> Force is strong with this one. Mm. Our calling, my calling, T Roy's calling, Justin's calling, Doug's calling, Zeke's calling. Jed's calling, Andy's calling. Our calling is all the same. We all have the same calling. Bear his image. God, what's my will? What's your will for my life? I have come to realize that's one of the most deceptive things that we can pray. God, what is your will for my life? God, what am I supposed to be doing now? You can't make him tell you something he's not telling you. And you don't need to make him tell you. Noah never asked him that question. Moses never asked him that question. Jonah never asked him that question. The disciples never asked him that question. None of them went seeking their call. They just lived. And when God decided what to do, God came looking and God gave them the idea. Our calling is all the same. Bear his image. You can do that right now, and you don't have to figure anything out. You don't have to figure out where you're supposed to live. You don't have to figure out who you're supposed to marry. You don't have to worry about which job you're supposed to get. You don't have to worry about any of that. Right now, you live where you live. Very good. To know him and to make him known. Listen to this. 2 Corinthians 3.18. And we all, this is for people that are born again and trusting in grace or righteousness. And we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image. We're being transformed into the image that we're beholding. We're looking at God with no veil, the veil of the law. Uh, a lot of people believe that their works make them right with God. They believe that their law keeping makes them right with God or something they can do. And as long as you believe that, there's a veil over your spiritual eyes and over your heart and you can't see God for who he is. When you cease to trust your works for righteousness and you trust what Jesus did at the cross, now you can see him clearly. 
with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, were being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. A lot of people that can't get free, it's because they are trusting their failures or their merit. And as long as they're trusting what they do or don't do for their right standing with God, you'll never get free. But if you'll throw that in the trash and just know you're righteous by the blood, you won't have to worry about it. You'll just be free. You will look at Jesus and you'll be changed into his image. Who is God? We can never explain that. But it's important that we know everything that the Bible has offered to reveal about who God is. What we know about God and what we believe about God directly steers how we view everything in our entire life. Our perspective of everything comes down to what we believe about God. The atheist, their life is steered by what they believe, or rather don't, about God. Nobody can get around this. You're living your life as a direct result of what you believe about God. God. It's important. It is important what you believe about God. So this evening, we're going to look at him. Let's begin to be curious about the layers, about the colors, about the effects, about the heat and the power. And let's look at him. John 4, 23 and 24, Jesus is speaking. The hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Spirit. God is a spirit. What is a spirit? What is a spirit? It so happens that you are a spirit. When I look at the room tonight, I can't see you. I can see your container. I can see the flesh that your spirit is holding up. But I can't see you. You are a spirit. What's a spirit? Well, a spirit is not physical. It's not physical. A spirit is not a body. A spirit cannot be measured with a ruler or weighed on a scale because it's spirit. But that makes it no less real. As a matter of fact, a spirit isn't an it at all. A spirit is a who. A spirit is someone, whether the spirit is in a body or not. The spirit is real, whether or not it's in a physical body. One day you will leave your body. And you will be no less you than you are right now. As a matter of fact, you are more you than your body is. When we feel a touch in a service like this, we are not human beings having a spiritual experience. No, right now we are spirits having a earthly experience. What is a spirit? A spirit is an intelligent, 
conscious thinking, deciding, aware, active person. In the case of God, this spirit is the supreme spirit, the ultimate, the maximum, and the creator of all that is. All things that exist, exist because of him. And nothing exists without him, this spirit. Everything that exists, he spoke it. He breathed it. His breath in Hebrew is called the Ruach. He spoke it, he breathed it, he set it in motion. And he's the one holding it all together by the power of his word and by the word of his power. God is a spirit. He's an eternal spirit. Now we think that means he will last forever, and he certainly will. But harder to understand than that is that he always has. He has no starting point or finishing place. And he's a self-existent spirit. He wasn't created. He wasn't made. He simply is. He simply is and has no starting place this self-existent spirit. Our Father is not confined to ten fingers and ten toes and elbows and shoulders. He doesn't have a body like that. The Bible talks about his hand, but that's really an explanation to help us relate to his activity. The Bible talks about eyes, but it's not what we think of. It's that he is a seeing spirit. The Bible may speak of his mouth, but it's not one moving like mine is right now. It's that he is a speaking spirit. Now, we know that when God the Son came to earth, he was born into a human body, and he has a body. But we're talking about who God is himself, not him inside of a human body. Concerning his strength and his power, it is limitless. There is no bounds to God's strength and to his power. He is omnipotent. His potence and his potency are uncontainable. He is all powerful. Concerning his knowledge, it is infinite. He is omniscient. If we were to know all of the knowledge of every human being on earth, if we could suddenly know everything that every person on earth that has ever lived has known or knows or will know, it would not be close to all the information that exists in existence. It would only be a sliver. But God knows all that is. And he didn't learn any of it. God has never learned anything. This self-existent spirit is completely whole and has always been completely whole. He has always known all information that could ever exist. And not just the information, not just the facts, but his wisdom is infinite. This means he knows ahead of time the best way. 
He knows the best decision. He knows every outcome. He knows everything that the future holds. He knows the result of every choice that you will make. Concerning his location, he's everywhere. There's nowhere that he isn't. If you go anywhere on the earth, he's there. If you fly outside of the Milky Way galaxy and go 10 billion miles away and 10 trillion miles away, he is there. And when I say he's everywhere and that he is whole, I don't mean that there's the part of him that's here and the part of him that's beyond the Milky Way and the part of him that's in the sun and the part of him that's out here on the parking lot. No, all of God is right here in this room. Amen. And all of God is on Mars. And all of God is on the star Beetlejuice. I just wanted to say Beetlejuice. But it is, but it is a star. Don't say it again. Don't say it again. <laughs> what, Beetlejuice? <laughs> what did he say, Beetlejuice? All of God is inside of Jeremy. There's no part of God that's not inside of him. Or Nate, or Zach, or Justin. All of God is in me. And all of God is everywhere in every place. He is omnipresent. Not only is he everywhere, he is also every when. There's not a time that he's not in. Rather, time is in him, and really there's no time. He does not have a beginning or an end. But he is the beginning, and he is the end. He's the first. He's the last. He's the alpha. He's the omega. He has always been and will always be. He is unchanging. Not only has he always existed and will always exist, but 10 billion years ago, he was exactly the same way he is now. Right. And in another 10 billion years, he will still be exactly as he is right now. When Adam prayed to him, he was exactly the same way as when we prayed to him. Right. When Jacob called on him, when Moses called on him, when Daniel called on him, when Jonah called on him. God has always been the same God and God has always been completely the same. There has never been a moment in ageless past that God was different than he is now, nor will a time ever be. In Malachi, he claimed, I am God, I change not. The God we pray to tonight is the same God that's always been prayed to by all of the saints of old through all of Scripture. And the same God is the same as he was and is and will ever be. We cannot explain him, but he has chosen to reveal himself to us and call us unto himself. Not only is this spirit a person, but he's personal. This star breather, planet speaker, all power, Every place, every time, can be known. That's right. And that's the mystery. There's a great old hymn called The Wonder of It All. And uh, George Beverly Shea used to sing it at the Billy Graham Crusades. And then I, at one time I was pastoring a second church called Dogwood Chapel. And there was a little old lady, little bitty white haired lady named Nellie. She didn't do country grammar. She did a lot of old songs. Anybody? All right, never mind. This, 
she was a very different Nellie. But anyway, she would, she was one of those ladies, her throat would kind of, you know, wobble when she said it. And she'd sing, the wonder of it all, the wonder of it all, is the wonder that he loves me. And she would sing all those verses. That's the wonder of it all. That this kind of a being, that this kind of a spirit, that this God, that I can know him, and that he wants me to, and that he likes me. <laughs> if we were to learn all of these big, awesome things about God, and then discover that he was wicked, we would have a huge problem on our hands. But what we get to tell everyone is that this boundless, limitless, everywhere, all-knowing, all-powerful creator is good. Amen. God is good. Yes. And God is love. And he's a father. That is really something. The good news is that the great God is good. He doesn't have goodness. He's what goodness is. That's right. The only reason we know what good even is, we learned it from the outflow of who he is. He is what determines goodness, and it flows out from his being. He radiates. He radiates his goodness. He shares it. This God, this spirit, shares his goodness. He loves to. He loves to share his goodness, for he is love. He is love. The Bible says God is love. He's what love is. And he's righteous. He does everything completely right. There's no shadow of turning in him, the Bible says. He is light. And he is right. He does everything right. He does everything whole and correct and good. He's righteous. Not only is he righteous, but he's holy. You know, there are those created beings around him that have not sinned. They are righteous, but they are not holy. They cry holy in all of him. He's not just righteous. Holy means cut off. Holy means some different, uncommon, set apart. God is holy. He's not like us. There are ways we're supposed to be like him, and then there are ways that we cannot be like him. He's God alone. By the way, there's only one. There's no God beside him. There's no God above him. He is God alone. He's not competing with the other gods to be God. He is God alone. Amen. No enemy can stand against him. Hallelujah. He's holy. And this one wants to live out who he is through you. All of that that I just shared. The Bible says he wants to tabernacle amongst men. That we're the temple of the Holy Spirit. This God wants to fill who you are and flow through you. That's the purpose of life. That's the mystery. What's the point of all this? That is the point. This creator wants to so fill you 
that for somebody to encounter you is like coming in contact with him. It is coming in contact with him. God wants to so fill every part of your psyche and your mind and your body and where you go and what you do and how you talk. I'm not talking about taking away your personality. You'll be you. But then when you walk into work, Jesus just walked in. He wants to live out who he is and what he is in and through you. But he only does this through one thing. Our knowing who he is and how he is. There are many people that have accepted Jesus' gift of forgiveness that he paid for on the cross. They still don't know him. They've accepted his free gift, but they're not knowing him. They don't know any of this stuff that we just shared tonight. The only way that God can live in and through you, the Bible says in him we live and move and have our being. The Bible says once we're born again, we live in the spirit, let us walk in the spirit. God wants to so fill every part of your life. And the only way he can, it's as you get to know him. 2 Corinthians, as we behold him, we are changed into his same image a little bit at a time. Glory to glory to glory to glory to glory. Knowing him. But no one seems to be interested in knowing him. Even in the church. His church wants to go to his Bible as a secret code book. His church wants to use his life as a self-help manual with powerful little things we can use until we really, really excel. But they're not going to his word looking for him. And who he is and what he's like. No one seems interested. They just want his help. But I want him. <laughs> I want him. These last few months, there is a prayer stirring in my heart. And I hear it all the time. Almost every time I get by myself, almost every time it gets quiet, almost every time I stand still and look at a fire. Something comes up and I say, who are you? Like really, really, who are you? Show me. I want to know you. Listen, I got saved when I was six. I went to the ministry when I was 11. I've been in the ministry for over 30 years. And I'm saying, what are you like? I want to know him. I want to know him more than I've ever known him. I'll tell you what else he is. He's an all-consuming fire. Yes, he is. God is an all-consuming fire. That when we behold him, like looking at that fire, when we behold him, that when we get close to the fire that he is, it starts to burn out everything that's not him. And when it gets down to what's only him, then he just burns and shines through us. Look at this. The earth, the moon, And the sun. Can we set this on, on something? Or can we set this on and just sit here and be the sun? Two chairs, three chairs. All right, whatever we get, whatever I have to do. Yeah, or somebody hold it. Yeah. Yeah, leave it all. It's good, Eric. We're all right. This will be simpler. Occam's razor. All right. I'm sure everybody's familiar with how this works. You are here. 
We are on this terrestrial ball that's hanging on something invisible. That's all right, Dave. This is hanging. Dave always got, he is way extra if you know what I mean. <laughs> this, this terrestrial ball is hanging on the word is power. Yeah. And the sun is over here. It's hot. And, you know, we're on this revolution. We go around the sun while we spin. That determines what, where it's day. Right now it's day here. It's nighttime over here. And the people experiencing daytime, they can't really see the moon right now. The people that are having nighttime, they can see the moon. Even though the moon is not producing any light, the sunlight that's hitting this side of the earth, making it daytime, the sun's very big, very big. It's going around, and the moon is catching that light. So the people at nighttime, they can see the light of the sun on the moon, right? So the Bible says that he created two great lights. One to rule the day, provide light in the day, and one to rule the night. But this one's not actually a light, is it? There's only one source of light. This one is only a light by reflecting. The light coming off the source. The moon produces nothing. It only reflects. It gives light by reflecting light. Is anybody picking up what I'm putting down? What it gives off, it doesn't make. It only receives it and then gives it away. It receives it from the source of light and then shines what it got from the source. It only gets what it has from the big ball of fire and then bounces that same heat where it is needed. I want you to notice something else. Pink Floyd told us about the dark side of the moon. <laughs> this is the dark side of the moon over here. It's not giving anything to anybody. The only part of the moon that is fruitful is the part that's facing the sun. Come on, somebody. The two great lights. God is the sun. We are the moon. Yeah. We're the lesser light. We get light from the source by looking at him. And the part of us that's facing God can then reflect and bounce his light and his warmth to the dark world. Amen. Today, Jeremy and I were sitting by the fire pit. There was no fire in today. And all of a sudden, it started getting hot. The temperature started to change outside. I had on a, a hoodie, and I was feeling it all of a sudden. And then he had on some warm pants over his shorts. He started, we got hot. We started stripping stuff off. We had to change how we were dressed when we were exposed to the sun. And when you start looking at God, like looking at the fire, 
When you start getting close to the heat, you're going to have to start stripping some stuff off. That's right. You're going to realize, I don't need this. Amen. My warmth is not coming from something man-made anymore. All I've got to do is look at him and be close to him right. by knowing him. through in a year uh, I've got two days left I'll probably do them both tonight I'm so excited to start the Bible over I want to read the Bible again in my whole thought I want to read the whole Bible looking for God I'm not, I don't want to look for any answers I don't want to look for any help I don't look for one for getting free from an addiction I'm not going to look for getting free from, I don't want to go looking for blessings. I don't want to go looking for provision. I don't want to go looking for finances. I don't want to go looking for life to be easier. I don't want to look for him to do anything for my marriage. I don't want to, none of it. I want to read the Bible, his book, by the way. That's right. It's about him and how he interacts with humanity. I want to reread the whole Bible, looking every day. I wonder what I can learn about what he's like. I promise you, when you get where you are facing him, suddenly you will fulfill everything you were made for. And that will simply be to reflect him back to the world. Thank you, Levi. Can you give Jesus a great <laughs>
uh, or you can kneel in your chair, or whatever you want to do. You can stand in the back where it's quiet, lay on the ground. Uh, maybe you want to stand with your hand. I don't care. While Vince plays, can you just get somewhere? And let's just take a couple minutes. And maybe you want to ask God, Who are you? What are you like? Tell me about yourself. And let's start knowing him. Let's do it now.